Yeah. It is going to work. Okay. <laughs> if it doesn't, I have a plan B, which is to leave. <laughs> Hopefully this will work okay. So good morning. I or afternoon now, isn't it? I'd like to start off with a quick show of hands. Uh, who here in the room has heard of the term mobile first? Raise your hand if you heard the term mobile first. Okay, so the majority of us. Uh, and I want you to think very carefully about how you raise your hand for this next question because I'm going to call on one of you. But who here can explain what mobile first means when it comes to website design development? This is supposed to make this easier for me as a presenter right now. Really <laughs> sure. Leave me hanging. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and take a shot at it and tell you what we know. So mobile first is something that was coined around the late 2000s. Uh, in the aughts, if you remember that heady time. Before, the, uh, before that time, websites were designed primarily for desktop, and then mobile devices started proliferating, starting with the iPhone really kicking off a trend of smartphones, smart devices. I'm obligated to say that Microsoft had smartphones well before Apple did, but Apple did a great job of making them marketable. What we learned with mobile first, though, is that the most important thing is not designing for a tiny screen. That's not what mobile first is all about. The most important thing is getting the most important thing to the most important person at the right time, the user. So as we were building websites, and uh, the company I'm with entirely we've been around since 1999, and we've been building websites for a long time, since 1999. That's 21 years, if anyone here is good at math. Uh, and when we started and built our first mobile first site in 2008, it was for a large national hotel chain. And we had built a beautiful desktop site for them. It was gorgeous, had fantastic branding, had told a great story, it was immersive, it was a beautiful visual site. And when we went to build the first mobile site, we tried to come up with the use case, which starts with the user, right? What is the use case of someone who needs to access a hotel from their mobile phone? Can anyone answer this for me? Think of this just off the top of your head. Anybody? Reservation. Making a reservation, that's right. Hopefully not when driving, although in 2008, <laughs> I mean, it was a different time, things can happen. So that's exactly right. They wanted to make reservations on the phone. You're driving along, I need to stop, I need to go. So we did at the time uh, what was a really radical thing. We stripped the experience down to just the most important thing for the most important person, the user. We got rid of all the branding on the homepage except for the logo, and we put the reservation system right there. When you hit the homepage, that's what you got was the reservation, uh, and, the, and a calendar and a location to be able to the conversion rate on the site of people who went in and booked a room went through the roof. In fact, it was far higher than the beautiful desktop experience. And that was transformative to our evolution and how we build sites. We put the most important thing in front of the most important person at the right time. That's what mobile first is all about. And when we think about, uh, we're here, we're adding vision, we think about folks that are differently abled and experience the world differently than we do, we want to do the same thing, and there are a lot of reasons for doing that. I'm going to explain what those reasons are and how that works with the next 40 minutes or so that we have. Uh, I probably will keep calling on you, so hopefully uh, someone will, will answer besides just Shemaine who's rescuing me here. I appreciate that. <laughs> just to let you know, we want to make this as interactive as we can. But uh, this, this concept of mobile first is super important, and now today you would never build anything, an app, uh, any type of experience that isn't optimized for a mobile screen first and really drilling down on the, the content needs to be done. So uh, we're going to enter now into the credibility building portion of the presentation, where if you aren't just entertained and want to believe what it is, you get to judge whether or not I know what I'm talking about. I work for Antara. We're a digital agency. We're about 50 people. We're located in Johnson City, Tennessee. Anyone heard of Johnson City before? Yeah? Was it from a song by any chance? Yeah. 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 Darius Rucker and I have a serious problem because he popularized a song that had a geographical error in it about our city. We, uh, if, you've heard, if you're familiar with the song Wagon Wheel, Johnson City is not west of the Cumberland Gap. We are actually east of it. So if you didn't learn anything else today, I hope you take that away with you. <laughs> Darius Rucker was wrong, Old Crow Medicine Show was wrong, but he had a chance to correct it. So we're located in East Tennessee, and we, we serve a lot of great brands. We'll talk about that in a minute. We have a goal and a mission. Uh, we're equal parts management consulting. We always lead with consulting. But we actually, unlike a lot of consultants, build websites and build digital experiences. So we're a creative digital agency, plus we build technical integrations 
and we did consulting. And the doing of the building of these sites and being accountable for results informs our consulting practice and helps us do a better job. Our mission is to transform institutions. So businesses, nonprofits, healthcare, uh, you name it, we want to help you move from an analog state into a digital business and take advantage of all that digital has to offer. And being that I'm with the marketing group, I know that uh, each of your individual missions, each of your individual whys, has to do with communicating and empowering people through the message that your organization has. And what's interesting about that is when we think about accessibility, we all, we all care and we're all passionate, but as you'll find out in just a minute, we're not doing such a great job of making websites accessible. This is not displaying at all, but you'll have access to the chart afterwards. We're a digital agency, as I mentioned, we do original research. We've been here in Envision all week doing research, and we also do the website builds all the way through site optimization, product information management, that sort of thing. That's the angle that I'm coming at things from. And we've been, had the privilege of doing it for some very large brands over time. We don't only work with big brands, but you'll see some up there that you may recognize, Estee Lauder, uh, Converse, Coleman, and others. And we've, uh, our, our history in Wichita, even though we're in Johnson City, uh, actually goes back to 2007. We were the digital agency of Coleman for about five years, then Value Place, uh, Extended Stay Hotels, which is actually who we built the mobile point site for. And then now we've been working with Envision as their digital agency of record for the last six years. And I owe them personally a big debt of gratitude. I've been speaking on accessibility for about four years. And nearly everything I've learned, I've learned from the great people at Envision and the wonderful patience that they have and the, just the everyday heroes and saints that are on the front line of helping transform lives. So it's a wonderful organization. Really, really happy to be here today to talk about this. Okay, enough about us. That's the last selling I'll do. As I mentioned, we're all marketers here or have something to do with marketing. And we care about communication. And uh, with websites and the, the advent of the internet, it's supposed to be a technology that empowers us. I think we've all felt that empowerment. We're able to do more with less time. We're able to stay connected with people who are far away. And it's transformed all of our lives, no doubt. And one of the most interesting statistics that I've read about uh, people who are blind and visually impaired have challenges just uh, being able to see and access the web is only about 1% of them were born blind. The vast majority of them actually end up becoming blind through accident, through disease, or other circumstances later in life. So that means if you look around the room, look at me right now and think about that, they're just like you and I. They're not in a, in a different class, they're not in a different status, they're just like you and I, just something changed in their lives and they can't see anymore the way that they used to. So this experience, especially now as we're getting further and further along, we have digital natives that are born, people have digital fluency and they go from being able to experience that to not being able to experience that. And that's a significant challenge and a real barrier to their functioning. They're finding accommodation in the workplace, they're finding accommodation with education, but not with websites. So how big of a deal is this? Well, the statistics are hard to come by to know exactly how many people there are. But according to the CDC in 2018, they reported that 27 million Americans are blind or visually impaired. And that's defined not as total blindness, but as people who have challenges seeing even with corrective eyewear or uh, any type of lenses. Now, the folks that are, are actually blind, that's also a difficult statistic to find, but the number's much lower. It fluctuates between two and four million, depending on how many uh, sites that you see. But the 27 million is the population of Australia. This is a significant portion of the United States. And also importantly, that population is expected to double in the next 30 years. Double. Our population is not going to double, but that population is going to double. Does anybody know why? People are living longer. Absolutely. Number one correlation with vision loss is aging. Uh, there are also diseases like diabetes that have com comorbidities that are important to consider, and uh, that, that population is growing. So this is a thing that's here to say it represents a huge consumer base as well. And accessibility is not just about the blind and visually impaired, although that's very important. There are also about seven and a half million Americans that have auditory challenges as well. And one of the largest traffic websites in the world is YouTube which is a fantastic source of information. It's the only way I can fix my car or my dryer or repair my bike or any other things that I do there. And, uh, but if you have a hearing impairment, there's a huge number of videos that don't have transcripts, don't have closed captions that need to be addressed. So I accused us earlier as marketers of not doing a great job of uh, making things accessible. I want to give you uh, a study that was recently done, this was done in 2019, where uh, the AIM Institute looked at the top one million homepages in the world 
And they used a massive data center to download all the home pages, analyze them for the ability for that site to be readable by a screen reader or other assistive technology for someone who is blind or visually impaired. Of those one million top sites in the world, which include all the brands we know and love, it's Target, it's Macy's, it's Google, it's this Facebook, this is everybody. 98% of them had some type of error that was so significant that it would cause a screen reader or other assistive technology to malfunction. What's crazy about this is that most of these companies, the big ones especially, are already doing something. They already have some accessibility uh, plan in place, but a lot of them are using automated technologies rather than people to do the testing, and it's introducing more error to the companies that don't have automated technologies in place. So we'll talk uh, about that a little bit more in a moment. But what's compelling about this is whatever you're doing, uh, and, and by show of hands, does anyone here have an accessibility program going on for their sites right now? We got, well, yeah, we did <laughs> yeah so, so just a couple, just a handful of these. Um, whatever you have going on right now, there's room for improvement, but the vast majority of sites are not accessible at all to people who have uh, DVI shots. But I'd like to use the, uh, the International Blind Eye Hockey Federation to make a point here, too, because as much as I'm passionate about and care about this topic, there is one thing that's resounding in my six years of being involved that I hear from the DVI community, and really people with disabilities in general, they don't, they don't want your pity. This is not a pity play. This is, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, these are people who are just like you and I that just have to cope and live with life a little bit differently than you do. And uh, stumbling upon the, the IBI, uh, which is incredible, they have blind hockey tournaments in cities across the US and Canada, and they're working getting an international tournament together. Uh, I don't know if any of you can ice skate, I can't but the thought of folks who are not able to see, you have to be 10% uh, at 10% vision or below to participate in this league. It's absolutely incredible. So there are people out there that are in research and medicine and changing the world, but aren't able to get online and pay their bills with the local government or access their credit card data. It's, it's not right, it's not okay. But there is a solution and there's a way for us to make a difference in a, in a really human and meaningful way to take care of all. So now we'll talk about the non-visual web. I want to demonstrate for you with this tool what it's like to experience the web um, for someone who is using it through a, an assistive technology. The most popular ones in the world, uh, JAWS, you may have heard of JAWS as one of them, is a screen reader. So if, you have, if you're blind or visually impaired, the web is primarily a visual medium, but a screen reader will read all the content to you on the screen. And in this case, uh, with what this gentleman is using, He's got a Braille output there where the text is actually going to Braille. Braille is not as popular of a technology that's actually on the decline by all the studies, but it'll read everything on the screen and allow you to access and navigate the site. You're not able to see the content on the screen. But the way your site is built has a profound impact on the way a DVI user gets that information through the screen reader. Because 98% of sites are not doing this well, it, I uh, was really tempted to use a major brand here, but knowing this might go somewhere else, I'm not going to. We made up, the, the creative team at Intar gave me a website called Pet Check. Uh, this is a made up brand, it's a made up site, it is not real, to demonstrate how a screen reader would read a website. In, in this case, and I'm really sorry the screen is low resolution, if I were to ask you, I'm gonna point out to you where it is, if I were to ask you uh, to, these are the different pet names, so there's dog, cat, fish, uh, bird, reptile, and small pet, that's what the categories are, the pet supplies. If I were to ask you to find bird food on here, and you could see this, it wasn't blurry, it's right, it's right here. Most of you would be able to find that in under three tenths of a second if you're sighted. And this is not a particularly beautiful site, but the way we're able to do that is using visual hierarchy, right? This is a principle of design we're all familiar with. What's the biggest? What's the boldest? Your brain will immediately process if I'm looking for bird food here. I don't need to look at the puppies, I don't need to look at the dog food, I don't need to look at the cat accessories. The brain immediately filters out the stuff that doesn't matter, and you get right to what you need to do, get to the bird food. But if you're using a site, if you're using a screen reader, and it's not optimized for the screen reader, this is what the screen reader is going to read. It will read out loud to you every single piece of text from the top left down to the bottom right. And you'll see here that there are things that look fine on the screen to us that are sighted, but are nonsense to a screen reader. It just says cat, dog, fish, bird, reptile. What am I, what am I getting at there? It also has things like shop now, shop now, shop now, shop now, shop now, because that's the call to action button underneath all of this, right? 
it's none of them doesn't make any sense. And there, what's worse is there may be entire sections of the site that are not accessible to you and you don't know exist because you have no tags on your images to describe what they are. And that presents a situation where uh, this is a great use case. I mean, if you're blind or visually impaired, you're, you're not able to drive, maybe you can't get a ride, you want to make an order to, for your service animal, you're simply not able to do it on a site like this, nor are you able to do the tasks you want your users to do on most of your websites, more than likely. If the site is optimized for a screen reader, it's going to be much more like an, a parallel of a visual experience, where it's going to name off the big categories first. So name off the utility nav, promotions, main navigation, banners, and categories. And you're able to go into the categories and know very quickly, I'm getting to bird, and then it says food and treats. So I don't know, has anyone here ever witnessed someone using a screen reader before? Have, have you heard it? Sounds like, I mean, pick your, yeah, pick your person. It sounds like having another chipmunk on helium. It's super fast, it's crazy fast. Um, someone who's blind and visually impaired can, can find that same result almost as quickly, uh, and in some cases quicker with a screen reader than you can visually if it's optimized. So that is what's at stake, is something that is usable versus something that is almost totally unusable. And the good news is that in order to go from this hot mess to this optimized page, adds between two to 5% to your web development budget. That's it, two to 5%. This is not a capital campaign. You don't need to get fundraising for it. It's something that you can make small adjustments in the code and put together in order to make that happen and make it usable. And the other cool benefit is that if you're making this site much more readable and accessible to a screen reader, which is a machine, you're also going to make it much more readable to Google and to other search, engine, uh, search engines that are out there because it's doing the same thing. It's giving a clearer picture of what the site is and what it's about to the search engine. Any questions on that so far? some more cool stuff. Uh, something else not to forget is PDF documents. This doesn't refer to just websites. Uh, also the documents you have on there, they're gonna present a table of contents in a PDF to a screen reader the same way you're going to look at site navigation. So some of you, uh, anyone here from, from government? Okay, we got a couple folks. I know you've got a lot of PDFs on your site. I don't know if you don't know your stuff. I know there's a lot of PDFs on there, right? And those need to be optimized as well, but it's the same process. And Microsoft's building accessibility uh, checkers and things like that into your documents too. So there, there's a strong potential to be able to optimize those as well, again, with just some common sense and some basic things, not a huge issue. So what does this mean for you? I love marketers. <coughs> We're the most beautiful people of the line of businesses. And, uh, that you can have. You know, we're not, no offense to any HR that's in here, but I do love marketers. We're wonderful. We're all good people looking around the room. We want to do the right thing, but businesses don't necessarily want to do the right thing. So I'm going to arm you with some ammunition, uh, both carrots and sticks, to take back to your organizations of why should we do anything at all, and then we're going to talk about, okay, but what do we actually, what, what's it take to get started? All right? So there are some great case studies of companies that have prioritized accessibility and achieved fantastic business results. Tesco is a supermarket chain out of Europe, and they were very early on the scene on this, probably the early 2000s when they got started. And they weren't sure how to do it because there aren't a lot of guidelines back then. So they built an accessible site and then a standard site. And what they found is that the conversions on the accessible site were an order of magnitude higher than on the non-accessible site. <coughs> Said, hmm, something's going on here. Kind of like Andy at Antara in 2008 going, wow, maybe we're onto something with putting the right information in the right place at the right time. And they actually ended up migrating their entire e-commerce presence over to the accessible site over the course of a couple of years. And the cost to do that was significant because they had two e-commerce sites, but they had an ROI of 13 million pounds in the first year on that effort. And they continued to prioritize accessibility ever since. Seeing that, they're a huge technical review site. They went and, like YouTube, they, most of their reviews were on video. They went and uh, created transcripts of all of their video reviews and put them on their site. All of a sudden, Google can access, because Google can't see your video, so it doesn't know what's in there. Uh, Google was able to access all the content for it, and they saw a 30% increase in organic traffic. You could, you could dump $20 million in online advertising and not get a 30% increase in traffic. This is uh, for a site that size. I mean, this is a huge gain for them. There's a lot of positive results. We've experienced this too, some of our clients. 
the Outer Banks Hospital, which is a, a hospital in the Outer Banks, you know, well named, right? Did, did well there. Somebody did. Somebody earned their marketing dollars. Uh, we redesigned their site a couple of years ago, all around making it accessible. And as you see from the design here, and if you want to hit this on your phones, you're, you're more than welcome to. I won't think that you're cheating on me. The Outer Banks Hospital.com is the website. And you'll see they're, they're, it's not just that the tags are set up in the background, but the whole design uses big, bold colors, uses high contrast buttons, because their target audience are retirees that are going there for the summer. And it made a huge difference. By redesigning the site around principles of accessibility, we experienced a 34% increase in organic traffic, which is huge. And in, in healthcare, it was very important for them to do that, to get access to care. So lots of great success stories and lots of great reasons to do this from a business perspective. But there are also reasons to do this from a compliance standpoint. Uh, in 2016, which is when the lawsuits really got going, there were over 250 lawsuits, primarily targeting major corporations. But what's important for you to know here is it wasn't just for their websites. Reebok made a beautiful site, but you couldn't use it without a mouse. You couldn't use it. Uh, but Panera created online or, or uh, in-person ordering kiosks where you can go up and punch in your order and everything with zero accommodations for someone who can't see you. They didn't even provide a person to help operate, it just didn't work. And the list goes on and on, uh, where really the Department of Justice, not individuals, were suing these corporations for producing things for the public to see that were not accessible. And they were prioritizing places that had brick and mortar, but as time went on, that started to be more and more inclusive. Isn't that wonderful? So there were over 800 lawsuits in 2017, Last year, there were 2,300 lawsuits. Uh, I'm sorry, in 2018, there were 2,300 lawsuits. And last year, there were 2,600 lawsuits that occurred, specifically ADA complaints about websites. And when we look at the primary industries that were targeted, I'd like to ask the question again, just by show of hands, who here is from the retail industry? Anybody here with a retail? Got one in retail? So you probably know everything that I'm about to say. I'm, I'm guessing, yeah, there's pain on your face. It's very, very, <laughs> I understand. Um, retail is getting hammered. Of the hottest sites to sue in 2019, which is not a list you want to be on, retail is at the top of over 1,300 lawsuits. Why? Well, it's because they're the easiest to pick on. Most of them have physical stores that you wouldn't dream of not putting a wheelchair ramp next to your flight of stairs to get in. But we do the same thing with the website. Build a beautiful site with zero accommodation for someone who can't see or who can't see it. So um, retail is getting hammered. And if you look at these other groups here, you may believe that you're safe. But let me share another crazy statistic with you. Uh, the Internet Retailer Top 500, which is the top 500 largest retailers in the world, and of the largest restaurant chains in the world, which is the top 100, they've got their own thing. Of those two together, those two groups, over 60% of the companies on that list, this is McDonald's, this is Panera, this is Mosharos, this is everybody. 60% have been sued at least one time. And 20% have been sued more than once on ADA web compliance. <coughs> and the rest of the folks fall into the category of yes. It's, it's coming, right? it's coming. And it should, I'm not a big fan of a litigious society, but when it drives change for the public good, I'm, I'm all behind it. Let's, let's get people accountable and let's make this happen again. It's not really difficult to make happen. Uh, even the Queen Bee, Beyonce got sued in 2019 for her site not being accessible. It's like people just, I, I don't understand, you're gonna be a target this time. Uh, when you look at why the judgments are being handed down, the Winn-Dixie case in 2019 was one of the most famous, I'm sorry, in 2017, this has been appealed twice by Winn-Dixie and they've lost both times. The judge handed down this ruling and he said, Winn-Dixie has presented no evidence to establish that it would be unduly burdensome that's language out of the ADA, to make its website accessible to visually impaired individuals. That's the logic of the courts. They're saying, guys, it's not that hard. You don't have a reason not to do this. You may just not know that you, how to do it. And that's, that's the way that the lawsuits have all been prosecuted, public accommodation. Okay, so we're all convinced we've gotta do something, especially those in retail. Let's do something. What do we do? So the, the two laws that are really pushing this are the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, I, I talk about ADA all the time, but there's actually a bunch of different regulations that are out there. States are getting involved. They're doing their own 
regulations. After this, we'll send out a copy of the presentation. It'll include in it a link to uh, a, an accessibility checker across the state by state that will tell you what legislation is present in your state. So you have that available to you. But this is becoming more and more of a local uh, issue because the national government is not going to take a stand on what the standards are. The laws are saying you have to make the spaces accommodation, uh, accommodate someone of different uh, abilities, but they're not seeing exactly how. So I'm gonna give you some alphabet soup here. The World Wide Web Consortium, the WC3, is an international body and they make standards. They are not a legal enforcement arm, they just make standards that say everybody should follow these things. They have a group within them called the Website Accessibility Initiative, which releases guidelines about every three years, or about every 10 years. And in there, you may have heard this before, WCAG, WCAG, is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Absent a national standard in the United States, Canada doesn't have one either, uh, most of Western <coughs> and Eastern Europe doesn't have one either, and the, the rest of the world certainly does not. Uh, the, the US is actually leading the way here. They use this international body of standards as the gold standard. So if you're going to be accessible by definition in the United States today, you're following the WCAG standards, WCAG. And I'm gonna break these down for you. There's actually like 500 standards. You can go and read them. It takes about 20 minutes, kind of enlightening. But we're not going to, we're not gonna make you do that. But they are what you need to understand. What I'd like to do is just, I wanna take one minute, and I'm going to take you through the principles that drive how this site is built. This is important so that we understand the why we're asking you to do certain things on the site. And in order to illustrate this first one, I'd like for everybody to stand up, if you don't mind. And just a lunch and milk, okay? I'd like you to look at somebody next to you or someone uh, across the room, and I want you to repeat these words in the most sincere way you can. I would rather be somewhere else right now. <laughs> okay. Great job. You can have a seat. Okay. The first, the first principle of accessibility is perceptibility, perception. And when you said that to someone else in the room that you made a connection with, you had some clues as to whether or not they really wanted to be done with me and be done out of this room, or if they were enjoying themselves and wanted to stay, which is what I hope my ego can sustain. Uh, can, can anybody tell me what, what things you could see in that person's, when they gave that response and they said that thing to you? How could you tell if they were sincere or not? I just see their eyes. They make eye contact. Yep. What else? Body language. Yes. Body language. That's great. Expression. Tone of voice. I heard somebody say. So there's a lot of ways that when we communicate with each other, so much of that meaning comes from how we are expressing and moving our hands, our body, and everything else. And, and when we're talking about the web, it's a similar thing. You want to make the content more than just the text on the page be perceivable by people who can see it differently. So what that means practically is you want to provide text alternatives for non-text content. If you go to the Envision site today, there's a, a beautiful image of a mom holding a baby in, in a sunset on one of the donation pages. And if you go and look at the alt text for it, it says, beautiful picture of a mom holding a baby in a sunset. And that just gives context to someone who can't see it. Uh, you can also use tool tips for other things, but that's what this principle is all about. You want to provide captions. If you have a chart on your site, which you may, you may not think about that, but if you've got a chart showing earnings are up, expenses are down, you put alt text in that says those things so that someone who's hitting with a screen reader, they understand it, they just don't get a, a blob or a nothing on the page. Um, these are giving people different ways to experience the content. And then you want to also make it easier for users to see and hear content. A huge source of accessibility challenges online has to do with low contrast text. Gray text and a gray background. Text that's too tiny that you can't enlarge and things like that. So that principle of to help somebody to perceive what you actually mean, that's what's guiding it. The O is operable. So you can leave here today as an accessibility expert with one key on your keyboard. Anybody know what key it is? It's the tab key on your keyboard. If you can hit a website and you hit the tab, start with that, and it starts taking you through the navigation of the site, it gives you the option to skip uh, key areas of the site, that's an indication someone's done some work on accessibility on the website. Uh, 
it's not just about being blind or visually impaired. There are also people with, with tremors or motor control issues that aren't able to access the site. But with the keyboard, they've got a lot better control and can do that. So making sure that people can access it that way. You want to get rid of barriers like content that slides across the screen really fast or carousel that advances automatically. Things that if you can't get it fast enough, you wouldn't be able to consume the content. And things go on and on. But th that's the main principle there is you want to make it so that people can operate it in different ways. This has big dividends when it comes to mobile as well and good parallels too. Because if you create content for a homepage, now we've got to make sure, I mean, there are uh, eight net enabled devices per person in the United States right now. Eight devices per person right now in the United States. That's supposed to go to 13.6 by the year 2022. If you think that we're building a website with 13.6 different displays for it, no way. We're just creating content that can be displayed in different ways. So what's great for accessibility is great for the mobile device proliferation as well, which is really the whole point of this presentation. So make sure that people can operate it in other ways. It needs to be understandable. This is also great communication uh, principles where you make it so that people are able to clearly understand what's going on. Seems logical, but how many people here have buttons on their website that say, click here, learn more, get the offer. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything to a sighted user either, by the way, but we all are guilty of it because it's an easy thing to do, right? Uh, and you want to help users avoid incorrect mistakes. So when you have feedback that happens on a form, it doesn't sound like a robot that says, Error number 657, invalid credit card input, order terminated. It says, oops, looks like you've made an error entering your credit card number, please try again. Those are the types of human things that we want to do. And I have to say, I was talking with, uh, with Hannah yesterday at Envision, who runs a lot of the outreach programs here, and she said this better than I ever could when she was talking about education. Because at Envision, one of the things that they do is they go and seek out opportunities to make existing programs accessible. It's far easier to do that than to start a new accessible uh, program. So if someone wants to learn uh, computer science, they'll go to computer science and say, here's how you instruct with someone who is DEI. And what she said to me was that as they're going and doing this, the greatest feedback they have is when you're instructing someone with DEI, the most important thing is you give very, very clear instructions. You can't leave certain things to chance. You have to tell them exactly what to do. And professors are finding that when they do that, they're getting good results from the DEI students, but they're also getting elevated responses from the rest of the student community. And the reason is you're giving better instruction. You're giving clearer <coughs> instruction. And so the principle of good communication, just like mobile, putting the right information for the right person, if you make a site optimized for accessibility, can you make it optimized for everyone? Because we all need clear communication. And then finally, R is robust. And for having the shortest sentence, this is the most complicated. And that's about making it work with all sorts of different technologies. So being able to access it from a screen reader, yes, or a braille reader, or uh, whatever the device might be, you simply make it so that it's accessible from as much technology as possible. And that's where specialized partners like Intara or the Workforce Innovation Center here at Envision can really help you to do that. But that's an important principle as well. I'm gonna skip through this um, next piece, except for one point, the WCAG standards, which we talked about, right? Those are the ideas of the websites, uh, how the guidelines for how to make a website accessible. There are three levels. There's level A, level AA, and level AAA. Level AA is the gold standard that people are not getting sued if they have. Okay, that's the one you want. So if you're looking for conformance and you're asking people, what do I need to be? And you're looking for a standard, this is it, level AA. Now, if you go to sites like Envisions or other, uh, or the National Institute for the Blind that are really optimized for screen readers, they go all the way up to AAA, which is including lots of the principles that come before that, but includes code that's written specifically for people who are DVI, uh, and it also has captions or voiceovers on videos. So it's not just relying on, on purely closed caption because you think about like the movie Rocky, during a musical montage, right, when he's running the stairs and he's doing everything else, there's a voice over that will describe for you what it is that Rocky's doing, so you're not just left listening to the eye of the tiger, which is not, and that's not terrible, you can't do that. <laughs> but you, you get the idea, you're, you're making the site really specifically for them. This is where we all should be and where we'd love to be, but practically, for, for most of you as businesses, this is, this is where you
crazy to be seen as levels up there. All right, last section. How do I get started? What do I do? Andy, you've convinced me. We need to do something. Where do I get started? Well, I'd like to say that the most important place to start every day is with a healthy breakfast. And I want to tell you a story. <laughs> and you asked me earlier, this is why I wore my breakfast socks today. I've got eggs and bacon socks on. Uh, I, have a, I have three kids. My youngest is six years old, and he has autism, some learning disabilities, some other challenges. His name's William, and he, he's the greatest teacher I've ever had. But William right now is obsessed with names in the way that only an autistic six-year-old can be obsessed with names. He wants to know where everything comes from and who makes it. So every Saturday morning, I get up and I make William and I breakfast. My other kids are older and they don't care, they sleep in. But William, he's up. And I make him oatmeal. And he was looking at me a couple of Saturdays ago and said, Dad, who made this? Who? What's our name? Who made this? Who made this oatmeal? I'm like, well, Kroger made it. Kroger's like our Dillard's. Uh, it's a yeah, local grocery chain. And uh, he, that was not good enough for him. Dad, who made it? Who? No, I mean, who made it? I'm like, well, there were growers, there were farmers, there were brand people, I don't know. And then knowing that I was coming to talk to you guys, and because my dad is a year application was missing a few credentials, I decided I'm gonna write Kroger. And I'm gonna find out who makes this oatmeal so I can answer my son's questions. And I thought, also, I'm giving Kroger a softball here. They're gonna have a great human interest story. This is gonna be a fantastic opportunity to connect to the community. It's gonna be great. So pick up my phone and said, son, I'm writing Kroger right now. I'm gonna find out for you. I get an automated response. It receives my feedback. Within 48 hours, they're gonna let me know. I'm like, this is going great. <laughs> yeah, I think you know this is going. And then, to my surprise, within four hours, they write me back. And they say this, they say, Andy, thank you for contacting Kroger Customer Connect. I understand that you would like to have the names of people involved in the supply chain for our Kroger oatmeal. <laughs> Not quite what I asked, but okay, I'll go with it. And then they say, unfortunately, we don't have access to this type of information. All of our suppliers have mandated that their identities be kept confidential. Please and thank you. And then a few minutes later, they sent me a survey. Now, <laughs> being a reasonable human being, I let it go at this point. But guess what Kroger did? They did everything right, technically, they were supposed to do. I got the automated response, the confirmation to talk to me, a real human being wrote back to me within four hours on a Saturday morning on an obscure issue, asking about the name of the people who were involved in oatmeal. <laughs> but they missed the most important opportunity, which was to make a human connection between myself and the brand. This was an opportunity for them to forget that I was, I was speaking here or, or will in other places in the country, but this was about them giving, having a chance to do the right thing by William and to have a customer for life from me. And while we do need to start with a good breakfast, we have to start any approach to accessibility with the right attitude of, this is not something you check a box on and then walk away from. This is something that you really have to, to have the reasons behind it in your heart and you don't have to make it, again, a pity play. It's saying, no, our content on our site for our brand is gonna be accessible to everybody. And it's not that hard to do what we should do. So practically, aside from writing Kroger, this requires education on your teams. The, uh, the Workforce Innovation Center here has, has actual um, EDI folks that do accessibility consulting, and it will also help assess your site and tell you what it is uh, needs to be changed on it. There are lots of organizations that can do that too, but you, right here in Wichita, you've got networks uh, that are that are providing employment to those folks. It requires commitment from the organization. There has to be an understanding, not just a checkbox. Again, technological expertise, of course, and a governance plan. This last point is super important. You can't do accessibility once and launch your site. You have to continually do it. It has to be part of your approval process as well as all the content that goes up. Super important. If you'd like, you can hit our website, guitar.com forward slash accessibility. There's a free uh, quiz. It's eight questions, it's really simple. We don't even ask you for your email address to get the results. <laughs> I know, right? We're doing the right thing. It's uh, that's hard for me as, as being you know with as a marketer, but you don't have to provide an email address. Ask eight simple questions. These are also questions you can take to your management and say, hey, our site doesn't do these eight things. This is pretty bad. I don't want to be like retail and get sued all the time. Uh, so that's intara.com slash accessibility. 
And certainly, uh, if you are more technically inclined, you can download the Wave plugin for Chrome, which was developed by a nonprofit. And this will give you a giant, messy map of everything that's wrong with the site. It's, it's a little bit misleading because you don't have to fix everything, but it can be a good indication of how far off are we. And then certainly you can visit envisionus.com and, and learn from what the programs are that are going on here. Also, workforceforall.com. Workforceforall.com is the uh, Workforce Innovation Center here at Envision that specializes in accessibility programs. Super important. They'll, they'll tell you all about what they're doing. Uh, you can also help people with employment too. Very cool. So that's the end of the conversation here. Our, my, my one way to you, would love to open things up for questions if anybody has any. Uh, but thank you so much for your time and attention. It's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm.